Welcome back to Sip the Tally Films. I'm your host, Coach Evans, and today on Ravens Daily for February 19th, 2024, we're going to be talking about our uh, Jane Doe coming up today, Ravens penalty problems, Kyle Van Noy and Kyle Hamilton's interview on the Athletic Football Show, Greeny's QB, three QBs that have a better chance of winning the Super Bowl before Lamar Jackson, and the timing of Nelson Aguilar signing and more on Ravens Daily. Our Jane Doe coming up today comes from AJC Sr., he writes, sorry guys, I've been sticking with the Ravens for too long. And after that Titans playoff game, I couldn't see how I could stay with this team if they didn't get rid of Harbaugh. Here we are four years later and another amazing chance to get to the big one. We had it right in our hands. And as the season went, everything lined up perfectly. Other teams had crucial injuries. Our team was amazing, except for our mandatory annual three-game Harbaugh and Deuce losses. When it looked like we had a chance to go all the way, I asked myself, what could John do to F this up? <laughs> then in total, Harbosh fashion, the playoff game became too big. Not for the players initially, but for the play calling. The players end up playing badly after they literally had to beat the Chiefs, their own coach, and their own coach. So similar to the 2020 Titans debacle, where we came out throwing and didn't run our running game, this time against the league's worst run defense, I can't handle another year of Harbaugh. The guy doesn't learn anything from his mistakes. I spent thousands of dollars taking my kids to see Lamar play every year, but it ended after that last playoff game. I would not spend another dime on anything's Ravens until Harbaugh is gone. Wake up, Bashadi. This comment came from my video titled, Defensive Questions in 2024. A lot of people feel the same way this guy does, and in the past, there were people that were in Harbaugh's corner. Some of those same people are not in his corner anymore. I'm, sure, I'm not sure what he can do to win them back, other than win the Super Bowl. The blame ultimately starts and stop with him because he's the head coach. And no matter how much it really is his fault, when you're the head coach, you must take the good with the bad. It's kind of like playing quarterback. You get all the blame and you get all the credit when you win or lose. Before we continue, if you're enjoying this content, hit that like button. And if you're really feeling it, share it on your socials. I would really appreciate it and would help me with hitting that goal of 10K before we get to the 2024 NFL Draft. Let's talk about these penalties. We're diving into an aspect of the game that is often overlooked, but can have a significant impact on the team's performance, penalties. In 2023, the NFL season, the Baltimore Ravens found themselves ranked as the third most penalized team in the league. While their aggressive style of play is commendable, it also came with consequences. What's even more concerning is that two key offensive linemen, John Simpson and Ronnie Stanley, stood out individually as the second and third most penalized players in the league, respectively. Simpson racked up an astonishing 96 penalties, while Stanley wasn't far behind with 90 penalties of his own. So what does that mean for the Ravens? Well, penalties not only disrupt the flow of the game, but also result in lost yardage, stall drives, and ultimately lost opportunities to score. To remain competitive, to reach their full potential, the Ravens must address their discipline issues head on. Whether it's through improved focus, better technique, or increased communication, every player must do their part to limit costly penalties. Kyle Van Noor and Kyle Hamilton were interviewed on the Athletic Football Show, and they kind of gave us some insight on how they prepared for the San Francisco 49ers and quarterback Brock Purdy. Here's some insight on what they wanted to do to Brock Purdy. Main area of focus, because they feel like a very pick your poison sort of team. You know, I think it started with the plan of what San Francisco's done to other teams. They've kind of bullied them in the trenches mm -hmm. uh, offensively and defensively. So it started there just playing with a different type of violence, a violence they're not used to. And then on top of that, just giving Brock Purdy different pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's in his second year so being able to trick him um, is not easy but it's a little bit um, when you're looking at it there's spots where you can take advantage and we were able to look at the tape and come up with a game plan as far as the players executing it and the coaches giving us a great game plan to go execute and then it happened to 
be a turnover fest and we just capitalized. I know everyone's like, oh, the turnovers were lucky, but there were good plays by totally. Kyle getting, you know, chop blocked and then <laughs> getting his ass up and catching the ball. I was rewatching that one yesterday. I made the comment on one of my videos, if it was, I don't know if it was a roundup or a regular video, that Kyle Hamilton was the most versatile and the most important piece of the Ravens defense. And he confirmed it in this clip. So let's check it out. Every single week. Like, what is the timeline of it? Yeah, I think it's, um, well, it gets introduced to me on Tuesdays. I think, I, I know, <laughs> I know Mike and the whole D staff is up there on Monday concocting whatever game plan we have that week. But. Um, it does feel like sometimes when we're in the defensive meeting room, like we're having like a one-on-one -on -one meeting sometimes. Because <laughs> they're just like, all right, Kyle, you do this, and then do that, do that, do that. But, no, I love it. It's awesome. And if it's if it's going to help our team, our defense um, get stops, and I'm, I'm all for it, whatever position I may be playing. What's the hardest part of juggling all of it, though? Um, I think it's just clicking into a different mindset. You know, it's 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 like going from left tackle to right tackle. You know, you got mm -hmm. you got a whole different – Play to responsibilities. You, it's, Nickel may not be as vocal, but once I go back to safety, I got to click back into being very vocal and talking to corners, backers, everybody. Um, but I think it's it's made me a better player. It's made me a smarter player, and, and I get a better understanding of all levels of the defense. You, I think Kyle Van Noy feels the same way I do too. Like it's language, the way it's taught. Like, why do you think you guys can be like chameleon, like but between games in a way that maybe other defenses don't have a sense of how to do that? Yeah, I, I credit it a lot to our coaches. Okay. Um, you know, it's crazy how – uh, I'm going to stop. You, you're crediting them, but you have players like this that's guy. Yeah, yeah, so, right. like, yeah. I, I don't want yeah. that to go yeah. unnoticed either. <laughs> like, but keep going. Sorry. No, nah, yeah. On Mike Greenberg's green list, he had the next five QBs to win the Super Bowl before Lamar Jackson, and in a certain order. He had Justin Herbert at five, Lamar Jackson at four, Joe Burrow at three, Brock Purdy at two, and Jordan Love at one. Let's take a look at what he had to say. Top five greatest NFL dynasties. Today's green list are the top five quarterbacks that will win their first Super Bowl next. And at number five, I'm putting Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert is as talented as any quarterback in the National Football League with the exception of no one. And he is now, for the first time, going to be matched by exceptional coaching. I think it'll take a year or two for them to clear up their salary cap situation, but Herbert and Harbaugh is a deadly combination. They will eventually go to a Super Bowl. At number four, I have to put Lamar Jackson. Frankly, I'm not sure exactly when he's going to win it if it wasn't this year. Everything seemed to be set up perfectly, but that team is too talented, he's too good, and the coaching is too good to leave him off a list like this. Lamar Jackson was the MVP this year and deserved it. The Ravens will be back in business next year. You have to give him a chance. At number three, I'm putting Joe Burrow, who I know everyone else is going to think is number one. If this was just about him, I would probably agree. But in Cincinnati, they've lost their offensive coordinator. I believe they're about to lose one of the most important offensive weapons in T. Higgins. And I'm a little worried about the things I'm hearing about his thumb. I don't know that Joe Burrow's health is going to be just 100% fine by the time we get there. But most importantly, those three all play in the AFC, which is why my top two choices are the top two choices, because you have a much better chance of winning the NFC. And so at number two, I'm putting Brock Purdy. The 49ers are actually the betting favorite on ESPN Bet to win the Super Bowl next year. And there's no reason to think they can't. Brock Purdy's contract will still be ridiculously team friendly. They shouldn't have to lose all their good players that quickly. The 49ers should be back and I'll put Purdy at two. But at number one, this might surprise you. I'm a believer in Jordan Love, my friends. Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers are on the come. Go back and look at the second season that Brett Favre was the primary starter in Green Bay. Go now, I like Jordan Love, and I like his young receiving core, and I do think he has a chance to get to the Super Bowl. But winning one before Lamar Jackson? Eh, maybe. I don't think the same can be said about Brock Purdy, even though he has a great cast around him. So he has a better chance of getting to the Super Bowl before Jordan Love, and I think Brock Purdy's getting better and better with each start. Now, I do agree that both NFC quarterbacks have a better chance of getting there before the AFC quarterbacks because they don't have to deal with a certain individual. Now, let's talk about those AFC quarterbacks. Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow, along with Lamar Jackson, just getting to the Super Bowl is one thing because they have to go through Pat Mahomes. So that in itself is an issue because they have to get through Pat. I think winning it will be easier for whoever comes out of the NFC 
Because the problem with the AFC is going through Pat Mahomes. So as much as I want Lamar to win it, I think if he can get through Pat, he can win it. But getting through Pat is an issue by itself. So I think Greeny is right. The two NFC quarterbacks have a better chance of doing it because the AFC guys have to get through the Chiefs and Pat Mahomes. And doing that seems to be an issue no matter who his receiving core is. Nelson Aguilar signed a one-year deal last night. He was on the list of guys that would have had dead money count against the Baltimore Ravens if the deal wasn't done today. There are a couple other guys on that list. Kevin Zeitler at 4.2. Gazelle was at 1.8. Rocky Sin at 1.6. And Geno Stone at 600K. I don't know if any other deals will get done, but I enjoyed what Nelson Aguilar did for the team as a solid three to, number, three to four receiver. I think his contribution to the team was needed and what was expected. I think another year in the system will give him the opportunity to grow with Lamar Jackson and Todd Munkin, and I think he'll have an even better year next year. So that concludes Ravens Daily for February 19, 2024. If you liked the video, smash the like button. Let's see if we can get to 150 likes. If you're new, tap the subscribe button and the notification bell so you won't miss the rest of this off-season content. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with me, and I appreciate you. See you on the next one. Peace.